somebody who was called me up. They were writing about, I forget which book of yours, and I don't know why they bothered to call me, but they said, you know, Joyce Carol Oates is not only pro prolific, but the annoying part is that every book is so good. <laughs> you know? What do you think, Joyce? <laughs> well, <laughs> That's very, very sweet. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you before we get into this, it might might be of interest to some of you that Joyce and I. This is our third or fourth anthology. We fourth our fourth anthology that that we've done together, and it's it's always an incredible. Um, I'll just say as and Joyce has done antho anthologies. Yes, yeah, so very. It's very challenging. Yeah. Whatever the book is, just it represents, in a way, a fraction of the effort that went into it. And there are many absent works that one can't get permission for because they've charged too much money or something's gone wrong. So to be, a, to be an editor of an anthology is really like embarking on a journey. It, yeah, it is. It is. And what's especially nice about this book, which I've, I've actually never done, is Jonathan being an artist himself. He's included art, including corrosive and wildly hilarious polit <laughs> political cartoons is so funny. Yeah, well, you know, I, I did, wa I really wanted the book. Um, do you know, it's like that feeling in the midst of, after you've pulled yourself up uh, off the floor as to what's going on in our country, our world nowadays, that you want to watch that episode of 20 years ago from Friends, you know? But I, I mean, I wanted some beautiful and funny things in the book, and we have that, you know? Um, and and uh, I think, Joyce, when would, I'm just curious how you feel about, um, I know you told me something about your story, which I'd like to get to in a minute, but what do you feel generally about, you know, the place of the writer and the artist at, at this point in history? I mean, do, do, is our writing affected so much by the, the moment, do you think, or? Well, that's a good question. I think, I think writing is affected by the moment. All art is of its time, but there's a certain timelessness also. And though it seems very grim and dark and perilous, the time that we're living in right now is probably not as bad as some other times, you know, like, you know, 1939 or 1940, and when the Holocaust was being revealed and the, the sort of horror that washed over uh, humanity. I mean, we're we're, I'm not saying we're exaggerating it, but we're sort of maybe not in quite as bad a situation. Some people lived through the McCarthy era where people were, there wasn't anything like the resistance. Yeah. The resistance is pretty palpable, all these people marching and the sense of solidarity and idealism. But in the McCarthy era, people were informing on one another. Yeah, yeah. Professors and teachers. And that really divided up what would, might have been the resistance, liberal people, just sort of isolated. So we don't have that. Yeah, it's true. I'm glad. I, I like hearing some hopeful thoughts. You know, it's interesting. Elizabeth Frank, who's in this book, who's, um, she's, only, she's a very slow, slow worker, but her father was Melvin Frank, who did movies like oh, A Touch of Class. He did all the on-the-road movies, but he was blacklisted. And she wrote a book called Cheat and Charmer, her one novel. And it's a Ramona Clay, but it's about her parents and what happened to them. And they, they moved to London because he could not work in the States. And they were, went from being very rich to having essentially no money at all. And then he came back and had his comeback movie was A Touch of Class, by the way, which was in the, I guess, 60s? I don't know when it was. But, um, and I asked her to write about that. She said, no, I'm finished with that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I think what you just said, though, you know, it's funny. So I want to ask you also then about your story, because I didn't know until you told me recently that you had been working on that story as, a, as an idea for a novel many years ago or several years ago. And then when you tell us more about that, Joyce's story, Good News, well, I, I work on my novels, my fiction, in maybe what sounds like a strange way. I will finish a novel, pretty much finished, and then I'll put it, put it away in a drawer, and it could be there for a couple of years. In the case of a novel called The Accursed, I wrote it in 1987 and finished it, and I didn't go back to it until about 2011. 
which is an it was like a moldering manuscript, which <laughs> all writers have these manuscripts sort of moldering in another room. And I would go and look at it once in a while, like a year would go by. And finally, I, it became the right time. So too, with this novel, I started writing on it. I remember we were in, in uh, traveling. My husband at the time, who's sitting there, was like a new husband at the time. It was, that was that long ago. <laughs> And we were traveling in some hot, dusty place. And I was working on this. And it was so hot outside, the blinds were drawn in a hotel window. So that was like 2010, maybe, I was working on it. 2009, it was really a long time ago. And it's a novel that is set in the, in the future that's not too far away. But the irony is, and this sort of nightmare feeling, is that when I wrote it, it seemed comfortably in the future and maybe like a metaphor. But now, today, much of it is actually like would be next week. You know, it is no longer comfortably in the future. And some of the areas of freedom of speech and freedom of press and just the, the, the idea that people can be de de deported People are being asked to, to show their papers. I don't even know what papers are. Like, I don't carry, often when I'm out, I mean, I don't carry my passport with me. You know, so it's becoming a world in which there are divisions where there's a concerted effort on the part of the administration to make people enemies of one another. And we're just not really used to that in this country. We're used to a president who may in the past say things that are so pious and platitudinous, you know, bringing people together, and maybe that didn't sound always believable. But in this case, it's just the opposite, that the things that are said are very believable and very hostile, and they're designed to make people divide against one another. And it's wonderful that the Women's March and all the, all the great men who join with the Women's March can overcome that and have a really mass uh, surge of optimism in the face of this sort of hostility. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting that a, a gentleman last night in Boston asked a question and he said, how do you get people on the other side to read this book? And it, it actually threw me for a moment because in fact, you know, this book was in a roundup of books, um, I forget where it was, but an Associated Press reporter called me and he said, I'm doing a, a, a roundup of resistance books. And I said, well, I don't think our books are resistance books. I said, you know, I, we didn't set out to do that. We set out to do something that would be thought provoking mm -hmm. and about the, about the moment, but would go beyond the moment and, and have hopefulness and, you, you know, things about race, about immigration, about sexual orientation, but about the freedoms that we experience. I mean, I know, as you just said, I mean, I grew up, I mean, I didn't really realize I was a privileged white man until more recently, but, mm -hmm. you know, um, the truth is it hasn't worked all that well, but anyhow, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, what I wanted to say was that I took a lot for granted, you know, and, and maybe, just maybe, this moment is not so bad for us because we're going to stop taking things for granted, right? That's we have to fight for them. Absolutely. Yes, and our colleagues who are, who are scientists are really confronting even more hostility. Um, you know, federal departments just becoming rigorously anti-science. That's so shocking in, in the 21st century. We never would have thought that would happen. Writers and visual artists, I think, have not faced that kind of censorship yet. Well, you know, we had a moment when I was a fairly young, I started out as a visual artist, so, and we had the moment, the Maplethorpe moment, as we all called it, you know, when um, I did get a National Endowment for the Arts, uh, and my, anyhow, I had to sign something that said I would do nothing obscene. Oh. Wow. with that, but I didn't read it, you know, I was young, I wanted the money, and then later, actually my wife found it and said, did you read this? And I said, this makes me want to make such obscene art with this money, you know? But I, I think, the, I do, do you feel that as an artist you had certain 
uh, freedoms that, or that did you, you did, did or did not consider them at all in your work? Do you know what I mean? I haven't really felt any uh, restraints. I think that I've been maybe fortunate. I haven't noticed it, you know, but I, I may not be representative of other people. Uh, since, since the election of 2016, there was kind of ripples of shock that took a while, I think, to, to uh, make their way through various um, enclaves. Like after 2000, after 9-11, and you, of course you lived in New York City. Yeah, I watched the second building fall down. Were you living on 22nd? Yeah, I, I, could, I watched street. it from the street. So. Yeah. Well, some of us who lived in Princeton were relatively close also, but there was almost like a feeling of a miasma that many artists, many writers, including myself, just couldn't write, couldn't. Somehow everything seemed hopeless. And I knew many writers who felt, well, what, what's there to write about? It was a sort of death of the spirit. It's like a trauma. And I remember, I remember those days. So, and you probably know this, my husband and I at the time were so depressed and, and, and also feeling very helpless. We went out to an animal shelter and brought home a kitten. <laughs> A homeless cat. So we thought we can't do anything, you know, really, but we'll make we'll make a little animal happy. <laughs> so that turned out. To, <laughs> so you know that's Sherry, and she's been with me since. Sherry writes since, books. Sherry, well, even more, Sherry does tweets. That's true. <laughs> Sometimes she does the naughty tweets late at night. Uh, but I remember that feeling, you know, what is art? with this rubble and all these deaths, and it was very existential. Not an idea or a philosophical notion of, of angst or anxiety, not, not, nothing intellectual, just like physical, like losing somebody. So I think that the uh, election of 2016, for some people, for many women and girls, I think, it was like that. You know, you're waking up to this world that you thought would be so optimistic and such a a wonderful symbolic gesture for women and girls, and it was just the opposite. Somebody elected who was sort of anti all those things. So I think that all the people in this book, uh, sort of relating to that, and, and the, the visual artists with a lot of gusto and having, having fun. The Art Spiegelman is certainly depressing. You think? I, I, yeah. Well, uh, I think yeah, I think pretty, I mean, beautiful work, but you know. Well, they're a sweet of uh, Ellis speak. Island um, yeah. images that They're beautiful, he, beautiful. Yeah, work. I think that. I mean, and he also does a piece about a woman who was disguised as a man for yes. most of her life. That was great. So, which is a, is brilliant. But you know that feeling. People have talked about just what you've said. People have talked about who have been in the who have involved in this book and written or did art for this book. All had that same feeling. You know. Yeah. And while reading this book has been so interesting to me because I would have thought that I knew a lot of things, but actually in reading these different perspectives, like I think it's Julia Averas, uh, a young girl from the Dominican Republic whose family fled some political violence, and how when she was a little girl in grade school, just her experiences were so, so, vividly realized and so touching. And there's no self-pity. It's more like, almost like, like a little humor. But she said the one thing that is true for all of us that I wouldn't, had never thought about, she said that she felt very um, alone because she was Hispanic and, and I think she was in New England. But when she went in the library and she opened up books, she was in a world of absolute freedom. She could be anybody, she could read about anything. And the books were a salvation. I had the same feeling, but I, but I didn't, I've never articulated it quite like that. Yeah. Well, I wonder if it's because, you know, she is uh, really closer to being an immigrant. You know, so many of us had immigrant parents or grandparents, but uh, Julia Alvarez writes about 
her, how she was growing up as an immigrant and also being exposed to, in fact, she taught, her story is going to a very prestigious art colony. She's going to Yaddo in the story and yes, she ends up nice. um, talking to the cooks and the cleaning women and finds inspiration from them. That was so good. It's such a beautiful yeah. story. Uh, but I think that, you see, that, I don't know. I mean, I, I want. I think all the stories, as you said, are so surprising. Often, right? You know, things you don't know or don't expect. Oh, or... and then Alice, Alice Walker's little story is called "Don't Despair," and we've all read Alice Walker. But somehow, this story just puts everything in a very condensed way. And she talks about being a little black girl growing up in the um, sort of the tyranny of the the white, the tyranny of the white majority. Mm. And that is really so searing and kind of, you know, jarring to us because with our white skin, as you said, we take it for granted. But, and, but they can't, someone like, like Alice Walker cannot take things for granted to the same extent. But this idea that we represent a tyranny, the majority, is so... It's necessary for us to, to sort of experience, even though it's a little bit startling. And to acknowledge it, I and think. Acknowledge you, it. you know, I think yeah. it's interesting because she writes, she, um, there are only three people in the book who didn't write actual stories, though most people wrote from some experience. Many, I, uh, many people I encourage to write fiction and to explore a civil liberty or a freedom or something. Um, Alice Walker, the thing that struck me the most, you know, I mean, she does talk about this fear of white men growing up and how we have this ultimate fearsome sort of white man now. Uh, but she also writes about the incredible bravery of her father going and voting for FDR, you know, when there were armed guards. Yeah, wasn't that amazing? And I, amazing. I said to her, could you write more about that? And she said, no. <laughs> she said, I can't because I don't really know more about it, except that it happened. My father didn't really speak about it. That was amazing. It was just a couple lines, and the story is so good. It reminded me of this movie of today, Mudbound. Mm. You've seen Mudbound? Just, yeah. Well, Mudbound is so emotionally gripping. It is completely draining. <laughs> In fact, I had to leave the room at one point. We were seeing it on, on, on Netflix, I think. I actually had to leave the room, but then I came back and it wasn't quite as bad as I had thought. And without giving anything away, you don't have to worry. If you see the movie, if you want to see the movie, don't worry. It has an <laughs> ending that is not tragic. <laughs> you won't believe it as you won't believe it as you're moving through that movie because it's not for the faint-hearted. But if you can get through it, you will feel uplifted. Right. At the end, you all do you agree? Yeah, it's got a strong kind of wonderful ending. Well, I hope you know. I think that it's something about you know something in the cre I wanted to ask you about this something in the creative process. You know. But, well, let's talk about Blonde. Blonde took you a few years to write. Yes. And yes. Did you feel as if, as one sometimes does when they write a novel, that they've fallen into a pit and they're clawing their way out? <laughs> it was more like a tunnel. It was a tunnel. Well, like a tunnel. Well, of all the people in the room, Jonathan may be the only person who actually has met Marilyn Monroe. I was just a boy. I know you're reluctant to acknowledge this. No, it's pretty wonderful. Pretty Another wonderful. time, you know. <laughs> He's written about it. You, but, you, he has actually written about it. Well, I had never met Marilyn Monroe and Norbert Jean Baker, and, but I did a fair amount of research, and I saw all Marilyn Monroe's movies that are available on uh, DVD. So I had a sense of her growing as an actress and, and getting maturing. And, and as I wrote... My novel, which is a long novel, it's a postmodernist novel, in the sense that it's being told by Norma Jean Baker posthumously. So she's sort of looking back over her life as, it's a, as if it's a movie, and sort of seeing herself from the inside and also from the outside. And I was the one who knew that she would die. And usually when we write, when we write fiction, 
we control our characters' destinies, and we don't have to have them die if we don't want to. But from the very beginning, if I elected to write about Norma Jean Baker, just to, like 10 years after her, her, her ascendancy to, to great fame, about 10 years later, she'd be dead. She had a very truncated career when you think about how iconic she is and how famous. But as I was working in the novel, of course, that was always in sight. It was like going through a tunnel, but she would have to die. And I thought of other things, you know, fantastic ways out or something, but to be true to the material, I wanted my novel to end right with her death. I didn't want to go into that nether world of speculation about who really killed her. There have been many books. It's not at all like that. No, it just, it sort of ends with there are different possibilities of how she died. And nobody really could say for sure. When people are addicted to barbiturates and have been very unhappy, they're sort of unable to sleep in the middle of the night, you know, reaching for more pills. If you happen to overdose, is that, is that deliberate or just a kind of accident, a kind of sad, tragic accident? Then some people think she was actually killed. And there have been books. Mm. Well, there's a lot of the subject because when she was found dead, the Los Angeles police came in, but already the crime scene had been ex altered, ex -altered, ex -altered and ex things were taken, and her telephone records had been expunged. So something happened there, we know. It doesn't mean that anybody killed her, but it means that somebody did not want something to come out to be divulged. But anyway, in, my, in writing my novel, I didn't want to go into that because other people had written about it. I think there's a Los Angeles detective that is totally obsessed with, with the whole subject. He had been one of the people who came in and he knew that thing. He knew that there was a cover-up. So he's, he's devote, he had devoted his life. He may not be living now, but it's, a, it's one of those things like the assassination of John Kennedy. Some people believe in conspiracies and they fall into that pit of writing about it and obsessing about it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go into that. Well, I was thinking, you know, I was thinking about how, um, you know, asking you to write for this anthology, I've asked you to write for other anthologies, and asking anyone to write for an anthology like this um, uh, is a hard thing to do because, you know, you're also we were giving people six months to write their story, form their story, paint their painting, make their thing for the book. And that, you know, that's a big thing to ask somebody to do. Um, and I think that it, it um, I, I just it reminded me, I had, and Joyce was in a, a, an anthology I did for, believe it or not, Rockstar Videos. And Rockstar Videos, if you have any, I'll say kids who play video games, um, they did one called L.A. Noir, and L.A. Noir, um, they decided they wanted to have famous writers like Joyce. They sent me a list. They said, would you do an anthology and ask fame, they, did I ever tell you this? And we want famous writers like Joyce Carol Oates to write Good stories. Touch, yeah. I did it. Not good writers, just oh, yeah. famous writers. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh, okay. I'm gonna pass right over that one, but um, and then you wrote to me, and I, 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 did. didn't, I didn't feel that I could do it for some reason. I said, you were on a book tour, Well, I, I think, right? I just said that I didn't think I could do it. So Jonathan just wrote back again, I think, Well, a little more adamantly. Actually, <laughs> I'll tell you, this is one of my favorite stories. Unless I've made it up, you tell me if it's true. So uh, all they said, they let me watch the game and it took place in 1947 Los Angeles and it had true crime and then they made me sign non-disclosures like who was I going to tell but anyhow they said just ask writers to write a story the only thing they have to do is set it in 1947 so Joyce said well I, I don't think I can do this and then about two days later she said and I still don't think I can do it but I had this idea because I finished blonde but I still have these other thoughts what if I had Norma Jean Baker in 1947 be roommates with the Black Dahlia. But I don't think I can do it. And I said, then I'll write it. Yeah, you did. And I thought, oh no, I better write it. 
Elizabeth Short, this is the Black Dahlia, and that's never been, that, that murder, grisly murder, never been solved. It's very likely that the two girls could have been roommates. We're not saying that they were, but it, it, it isn't impossible. They were about the same age. One was very blonde, and the other was black, black hair, very glossy. Does anybody know who Elizabeth Short was? Yeah, the Black Dahlia. James Elroy has written about her, sort of compulsively. Yeah. Was that a little clapping? Did somebody clap for James Elroy? James Elroy? Elroy? Oh. Have you ever heard James Elroy speak? Yeah. Mm. I think of him as the American Dostoevsky. Yeah. You know, that this, he's very deep, very mm. dark. Very dark. But he's been so obsessed with the Black Dahlia and with his own mother's murder, which he's kind of conflated the yeah. two. Yeah, but I, I, I think perhaps the point of the story that I was telling you is that how I blackmail people into writing for their <laughs> anthologies you know, I mean, I had no intention of writing that story. I didn't think I oh, could. Really? Oh, no. you didn't? Oh, I thought you were serious. Well, I hoped you did so that you would write it. And in fact, oh. it became an amazing story called White Rose or... White, Black Dahlia and White Rose. Okay. So it's a great story. You should find that collection as well. Um, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have to blackmail Joyce for this. Um, I don't think, I think most people um, said yes and were, and were happy to do it. Uh, the young writer, wonderful young African-American writer, Angela Flournoy, said to me, I asked people why they said yes after they said yes. And she said, well, I think it must have been a day that I was so furious about what was going on in the world. I thought, I just... I wrote back to you, and I just wrote, yes, I'll do it. And I said, well, then I'm happy something terrible happened in the world that made you write this story. But I mean, I, not, I don't, but um, the, I didn't know Joyce's story had, that, had been ba that you had been working on this at all. And maybe you'd want to talk about that and read a little tiny bit of it so people could get an idea of your story. Like okay, I'll just read a little bit of it. But to introduce it, I was working on this novel, which I had thought would be sort of a short novel. It's, I, the title was Vicissitudes of Time Travel, but my publisher and other people said vicissitudes. <laughs> so I had to change it to hazards of time travel, hazards of time travel. To me, it will always be, always be vicissitudes of time travel, even though it's not very marketable. So I had this idea of a slightly future world that in which things that we take for granted now have all been altered. But as I said, when I wrote it, it was more like a metaphor. But now it's starting to take place. For instance, in this world that I have evoked in the near future, public lands are gone and national parks, and there just aren't any parks anymore. There may be some old desolate uh, place of, with a lot of litter blowing around, but they're not kept up. And they're very wealthy people, and then they're just other people. And then the society is ranked by skin color. And that uh, seems almost to be happening right now, where people are, are uh, basically persecuted because of their skin color. And, uh, apprehended on buses and asked to show their papers, where, where, well, whereas white people, I assume, are probably, are probably not. And then there's the bias against science. The, in some quarters, one can't use the word climate change, I think. If, you, if you're writing Florida government, maybe, maybe the federal government, too, you can't use certain scientific terms. And, and so in my novel, too, there is this hatred of science. Science represents objective truth and the, the idea of experimenting and a, a methodology that's not political or biased or linked to religion. Science is sort of the beacon from the, the Enlightenment. And when si science is attacked because people don't want to allow that kind of questioning, the scientific spirit is one of questioning. So in, in my novel, the young girl, she's only 17 in the beginning, she does become a psychologist, but, I, but the novel becomes somewhat complicated because she goes on, she's sent in exile, she's sent away to another time, 
that the pun people are people who think too much and question too much, they're either vaporized or just completely annihilated, or they're sent to some other time where they won't make any trouble. So I'll <laughs> I had a lot of fun writing it, and maybe I've talked so much about it I shouldn't even read. <laughs> but my, the most fun about the novel was I evoked a world that's set in the Midwest in what would have been Wisconsin, but is, is, has a different name now. In the future world, there's only just all of North America. Canada and Mexico have been sort of assimilated by the United States, and the United States doesn't exist anymore, it's just this big power. It's not so different from the world that we, <laughs> that we almost have right now. If our, if our president had his way, but he's being checked and, and balked at different uh, stages, but if he had his way, I think he would just amass a lot of power and put some of his, his political opponents, I'm afraid he'd put them in jail if he could, he'd put them in prison. Once they're in prison, things happen to people. I mean, they could die, they could be tortured. I mean, what keeps him from doing that is probably just a little flimsy uh, veneer of, of something. So in my novel, the girl is sent to a place like Wisconsin in 1953. And she's at, a, she's at a state university where everyone there, all the research scientists and the writers and, and the philosophers and psychologists, everyone there is working on mistaken ideas. But the mistaken ideas that were taken seriously at that time, like if you were in psychology, you would be a Skinnerian, if you know who Skinner was. So you'd be following a sort of Skinnerian psychology and if you were an astrophysicist, you'd be following a, the idea of the universe, a steady state universe that was sort of like steady. And if you were in anthropology or maybe some other biology, you'd, you'd be thinking that the, the height of evolution was right then, mm. that all of evolution was leading up to like essentially the white Protestant American person, and that the people actually thought that was the highest peak of, of evolution. Now, we don't feel that way at all. I mean, we, we have a very different, everything's different today. But at that time, intelligent people did feel that way, and people spent their whole lives working in what we would see as, as dead ends. So I wanted to get back to that world in which uh, working earnestly, oh, and people, the poets were all rhyming, <laughs> and maybe there was the glimmer of beatnik poetry, but they didn't like that. You know, that was sort of, that's not really, that's not poetry. What we're doing, these little rhymes. And they did all these things that were so conventional and so proper, but in the 1960s, you know, completely, completely swept away. So this is, this part that I'm going to read is, she's in high school, and it's a high school where you're sort of, you have to be very careful not to be too smart. So the really smart kids, the really smart kids, they always get like a B plus. Mm -hmm. They don't want to get in trouble. And if they're, if they're not really careful about it, then they wind up with a D, and that ruins their lives. They're sort of set upon a life. You're, 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 you're doomed if almost at the age of 18, which is true from, for some countries in the world right now. But this girl is sort of heedless and naive, and she gets an A and she becomes valedictorian. Nobody else wanted to be valedictorian. And she's just sort of a, she's kind of a, a, a naive girl. In patriot democracy history, for instance, I question the facts of history, quotation marks around facts sometimes. I'd ask questions about the subject no one ever questioned, the great terrorist attacks of 9-11-01. But not in an arrogant way, really, just out of curiosity. I certainly didn't want to get any of my teachers in trouble with the Education Oversight Bureau, which could result in them being demoted or fired or vaporized. <laughs> and then she's, um, she's named valedictorian because the smarter kids didn't want to do it. And all her, her valedictory speech is just going to be asking questions, like, why are we doing this? Why are we at war? Why this? And, and the calendar started. We, they don't have the calendar that we have. They have a whole new calendar, and everything has been changed. And she's just asking questions, and this is the rehearsal for the commencement. But after she gives her speech, she's arrested. The words were brisk, impersonal. Stroll Adrian, hands behind your back. It happened so fast at graduation rehearsal. 
So fast I was too surprised and too scared to think of resisting. Except I guess I did try to resist in childish desperation from the rougher office's rough hands on me, wrenching my arms behind my back with such force, I had to bite my lips to keep from screaming. What was happening? I could not believe it. I was being arrested? Yet even in my shock, thinking I will not scream, I will not beg for mercy. My wrists were handcuffed behind my back. Within seconds, I was a captive of homeland security. And then the, she's denounced by the principal, who wants to dissociate himself from her so he doesn't get in trouble. She was warned. They were all warned. We did our best to educate her as a patriot, but the girl is a born provocateur. Even this expression, she was warned. When I wrote this, it didn't, it wasn't it Elizabeth Warren, when somebody was warned, she was warned, she was, yeah. And here it is in my, it's in my novel, and, and I'm afraid people will think that I just took a lot of these things from the, <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> Provocateur. I knew what the term meant, but I never heard such a charge applied to me. Later, I would realize that the arrest warrant must have been drawn out for me before the rehearsal. And so anyway, she's arrested. And then later on, the pr principal calls for an emergency assembly of the senior class. Jonathan had asked originally, and your first letter was to write about democracy. That's actually what you said in I the did, beginning. Yeah. And then it got a little modified. So this was my answer to that, democracy. So all the students, uh, her classmates set her into the auditorium, 322 students in the class. News of my arrest had spread among them within seconds. Gravely, the principal announced from the podium that Adrian Strill, formerly valedictorian, had been arrested by the state on charges of treason and questioning her authority. And what was required now was a vote of confidence from her peers regarding the action. That is, all members of the class were, were to vote on whether to confirm the arrest or to challenge it. We will ask for a show of hands, Mr. McKay said, in full, fair, and unbiased demonstration of democracy. Mm. At this time, I was positioned handcuffed with a wet, streaked, guilty face at the very edge of the stage. As he spoke, the principal glared at me, even pointing at me, once with an accusing forefinger as if my classmates needed to be reminded who the arrestee was. Gripping my upper arms were two husky officers from the Youth Disciplinary Division of Homeland Security. It's the Russians. There were one man and one woman. They had uh, blue uniforms with bi and billy clubs, tasers, mace, and revolvers. My classmates stared wide-eyed, both intimidated and thrilled an arrest at school, and a show of hands vote, which was not a novelty in itself, except on this occasion. Boys and girls, attention. All those in favor of Adrian being stripped of the honor of class valedictorian as a consequence of having committed treason and questioned authority, raise your hands. Yes? There was a brief, stunned pause. Hesitantly, a few hands were lifted, then a few more. No doubt the presence of the uniform youth disciplinary officers glaring at them roused my classmates to action. Entire rows lifted their hands, yes. Here and there were individuals who shifted uneasily in their seats. They were not voting, yet I caught the eye of my friend Carla, whose face appeared to be wet with tears. And there was Paige all but signaling to me, I'm sorry, Adrian, I have no choice. As in a nightmare at last, a sea of hands were raised against me. If there were some not voting, I could not see them. And all opposed? No. Mr. McKay's voice hovered dramatically as if he were counting raised hands. In fact, there was not a single hand in all the rows of seniors to be seen. I think then that we have a stunning example of democracy in action, boys and girls. Mm. Majority rule, the truth is in the numbers. Mm. Uh, Joyce is correct that my first sort of mandate, I, I asked people to, to write about, draw about, paint about, do anything about democracy. And then some of the contributors said, can we broaden that? And I said, sure. 
you know, um, wh however that strikes you, do it what you want. And, and I, I, I'm looking at the book now, and Russell Banks wrote about ex being an expat and the 60s and going to Canada. Um, Bliss Broyard wrote about, you know, sort of, it takes place at a party with a mix of wealthy white and black people, and Obama's about to come. It's a very odd story filled with all kinds of... Lee Child, you know, the great crime writer, who the other night said, you know, I'm just an immigrant. Yeah, and, really? and he, you know, he came to this country 20 years ago and uh, made Where? a big success of himself, I'd say. Where did he come from? Uh, he, from England. Oh, and uh, he, uh, you know, his story, he doesn't write, a, he, as he said, it's not a crime story, but it is a crime. It's about a hate crime that's covered up many, many years ago, but it's not, um, a, it's not Jack Reacher, you know. Um, th so there's so many, what Michael Cunningham writes a story and it's an unidentified prison where criminals, and reminds me there was a sort of, crossover with your story ever so slightly, but it's a, cr a, a prison where people don't know what they've done wrong. Mm. And he admitted the other night that he got the idea thinking about Guantanamo, mm. but he never names it. Mm. Or, um, uh, you know, there's just James Hanahan writes uh, a really shocking story about a black couple trying to adopt a white baby. And uh, it's a story I gasped. But, you know, if you can get me to gasp, that's pretty good. Uh, Alice Hoffman, like your story also, about a world that's disappearing slowly. You know, very uh, touching story. Susan Isaacs, I don't know, there might be a few people here who remember compromising positions in the 70s. So she writes a story that's really funny about a rich white woman who is suddenly helping Haitians. And I thought, I said to her on the phone, you are going to be in big trouble with this story. And she said, why? I said, I just get ready. And there has been a little something, you know, but I sometimes think, you know, I, I always say to my students, I don't know what you say, politically correct is what you do in your life, but not necessarily in your art. Your characters mm -hmm. do anything they want to do, you know? Just make sure it's not you. Um, so, you know, the, it, 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 the other thing I just wanted to quickly say, because I was told that we have to wrap up, and I wanted questions, but you know, we have to, you know, so you'll have them, and when you buy books, I know, because the tie-in that I want to say is we thought about a way to expand this book. And so all of the writers and artists in this book are really aligned with the mission of the ACLU. And there's a statement from Anthony Romero, who's the director of the ACLU in New York. Um, and they've been incredible. They've come to a lot of the events and spoken and um, it was a way of making this book something other than it is, you know. So, uh, you know, in, in, for an institution about civil liberties that's been doing it for almost 100 years. And, and so that this is, is something for them as well. Um, and I hope you will all join Joyce and myself in a little while. I don't know where we're going, but somewhere back there um, to sign books. Um, again, I guess, you know, when I think about um, one of the, the, let's say, you know, in a time, Joyce brought up something so earlier about, you know, the hopefulness and other bad times in the world. You know, hopefully we'll look back at this book and we'll be looking at these stories in a different way, that they represented a moment, but they also represented feelings of writers and artists. And, you know, I think the writer's, writer's voice is, always important, you know, as much as any, but you know, I, I feel so much, you know, it's sort of like that feeling we, we talked about, you know, like as you said, of artists being flattened, like after 9-11, not being able to write, not being able to work, nothing matters, why should I do it? And then you realize if you just do something, you know, it's like going to your job. It's mm -hmm. like doing something makes you feel better, right? Just action is better than non-action. And, and so, you know, maybe this is a call to arms, you know. It, it's seeing, um, for me, it's very both distressing and touching 
to have a, a daughter who's marching. I thought we were long past those days, you know, long past them. Um, and being, you know, all of the things that I think our generation for, fought for. Did Dory march with them? My daughter marched in all of the marches, yeah. yeah. They look right. so wonderful. So, but I, you know, I wish she didn't have to do it. I wish none of us had to do it. But, but maybe this is our, our time to remember not to take for granted what we had, what we have, Absolutely. what we want to have again, you know, what do we need to preserve. Um, and and I, I, I hope that, you know, having, very important to me to have writers and artists of the stature of somebody like Joyce Carol Oates, who are willing, you have to realize, who are willing to put their reputations as artists on the line. Not everybody's going to agree that you're in a book like this or that you're going to speak out, you know? You, there's a risk involved. And that, that, I find, is an incredibly touching and meaningful thing, you know? That, that somebody is, will, you know, that Joyce Carol Oates is willing to be here and say this and to put it in print, or that Lee Child, who's our most popular crime writer, you know, is willing to take a risk that no, some people won't buy the next Jack Reacher novel, I think is brave, you know? It's putting something at personal risk. Um, in any case, do you have some last words, Joyce? No, I think what you're saying is really very, uh, very wonderful. And it's, it's an optimistic feeling. I think all, all art is generally op optimistic. Samuel Beckett said, just to be an artist is to be an optimist, even though he was completely depressed and his work is very depressing. <laughs> the act of the art represents uh, having faith in the future. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I came of age at uh, the first revolution in this country, you know? And um, I thought we fixed it, but in any case, you know, I remember at that time, many other artists I knew said, you know, being an artist is enough of a revolutionary thing to be. No, not really, you know, that's just playtime. So um, thank you all. I'm sorry there's no time for questions, but you can, yes. Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you, Jonathan Setlover and uh, Joyce Carol Lotes. And I do believe that the books are available in the back of the auditorium uh, for signing and further conversation with the authors. Thank you so much. Good night.